Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again, to Messiah and Him alone, be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the 28th day, right, Anna? Yes. Yeah, today is the 28th day of the 12th month of the year 2017, dear brothers and sisters. We are almost at the end of 2017. What exciting times we are living in, dear brothers and sisters. Today, the Lord has been putting on our hearts today that actually I'm here to help. And our eight-year-old daughter, the Lord has been putting on our heart to share with us about the spiritual armor. It's a, another view of it, a panoramic view, as the Lord has been leading her about how the Bible portrays the piece of armor, how in these end of the end of the end moments, each pieces are very crucial to connect with our daily living through the scriptures, through the word of God, and how we exactly can fight this battle using each and every single piece. And what is that one thing which will be tying all these pieces together every single day? Dear brothers and sisters, we all know that life is not a playground. It's a battleground. It's a battlefield. We are at war. Every single day we are at war. Some of us, most of us as a matter of fact, I would say none of us, as a matter of fact, understand the magnitude of this warfare. We can see that, a glimpse of that in Daniel chapter 10. We are in serious warfare, dear brothers and sisters. The way Messiah is protecting each one of us, we have simply no idea, dear brothers and sisters. And what happens here in this world is Satan's strategies are... Of two kinds. Either he will make us believe that he does not exist. Or it will be to the other extreme that he is super powerful. He is extra powerful. None of them are true. Dear brothers and sisters. That's why God knows all about what times we are living in. What we will be going through. And that has already been laid out in the word of God. Dear brothers and sisters. Oftentimes we keep on emphasizing that we need to get back to our basics. We need to get back. To that supernatural message which comes from outside of our, outside the dimension of our space and time. We need to get to that supernatural message. The book which 700 years before even the crucifixion, the cross existed. Isaiah was talking about crucifixion. Before even to the day when we see Daniel. Now we are all charged up and talking about Israel and Jerusalem and everything. When Israel did not exist. Ezekiel told it was predict Messiah himself predicted the destruction and and Ezekiel and Ezekiel we see to the day when Israel will be formed 14th of November 1940, 1948. The day Messiah ride, did ride the donkey as it was prophesied I believe in Zechariah 9 9 out of other places. When we get, get to Daniel 9 why I was telling is Daniel 9 is so very crucial those last 24, 25, 26, 27, those last four verses, we can spend decades and decades and decades, a lifetime as a matter of fact on those four verses. And if we get to understand perhaps even 50% of it, we will understand exactly where, what this supernatural message is all about. Daniel 9, 25 actually tells us to the day that Messiah will be riding that donkey, when he did, when the triumphal entry occurred. Dear brothers and sisters, these are just examples we are giving. When we go to Numbers chapter 21 verse 6, we see there is, when the Israelites were sinning, that Moses went and petitioned on behalf of the Israelites for, and they were getting sick and they were actually being dying. They were losing their life. Moses petitioned and then God gave them a weird remedy. It sounds like that he had to, Put up a brazen serpent on a pole, which everybody could see. And if they see, they will be healed. We don't see, we don't understand why a serpent, why a brazen serpent. That sounds weird. And all over the Old Testament, we don't see no mention, nowhere you can go ahead and please do your own search and see if you can find why it was a brazen serpent in the Old Testament. But we do have the answer. Messiah himself reveals that to Nicodemus, when Nicodemus visit, visits Jesus at night, Messiah himself tells why it was and what it was, a typos which was anticipated. 
Hey brothers and sisters, we often fail to understand that the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. It's a supernatural message. Of course, it's written by 40 different authors over a period of 1600 years, but it's as a matter of fact written by one single author. And every single word, every single alphabet, every single placing is there by a definite design of the Creator Himself. In this world, when Messiah Himself tells us that in this world we will have trouble. Today we have trouble, we have suffering, we have persecution, we have things going on, dear brothers and sisters. But we don't take the Bible so seriously. God says what He means, He means what He says. Our minds are unfortunately in this world. The longer we live, our minds don't get renewed but get corrupted. Our minds are all filled with the quotes from so whoever it be, William Shakespeare or you take, you name it, John Milton, Winston Churchill, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, whoever it is. We just keep reading those quotes. We get excited in our flesh. We read and we forget it. But and when we get to the Bible and read those same kind of we come with an unrenewed mind and the same kind of philosophy, same kind of science works behind that. We cannot really grasp the message what Jesus is trying to tell us in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Jesus is promising us that there will be trouble. But he's also promising us. That take heart that I have overcome the world and so will we be. How with Messiah's power? We need to be plugged into that power. That's the word of God. The only way we can get stronger every day is through the word of God. Dear brothers and sisters, when we try and understand, that's one thing which happened in my life as a matter of fact, that when we try and understand, the Bible is just not mere Messages just mere put together by different authors for our daily living. Yes, it is, but there is more to it. It's a supernatural message which anticipates, which declares the end from the beginning. And it, that's only the Holy Bible which can do that. That's cha that changed my life because that's a supernatural message. It anticipates every single Heresy which Satan has to offer to us. Satan has nothing new to offer. Because every heresy has been anticipated by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. It is there in the Bible. The New Age, it is there in the Bible. You name it. The brothers and sisters, when Messiah says, when Messiah has provided us this piece of armor, we often stumble, we have heard over it today. If you are here, dear brothers and sisters, today if you are here, if you are listening to us, this is not a mere coincidence. God has something for you from this video for about the spiritual armor as we, as Anna talks, as we talk. Please let us, please do invite the Spirit of God. Let the Spirit of God guide us because in this end of the end of the end moments, it is only the spiritual armor through which we can survive as we are coming to the end of this year, there will be so many things creeping up. It's like one more year gone. Messiah has not come. Is it going to be delayed? So many doubts, fiery doubts of doubt, denial, deceit, lies. Everything will be shot at the same time. And this is the time, dear brothers and sisters. We need to buckle up. We need to girdle up. We need to make sure that we fight this fight, good fight, with Messiah's strength. Today, dear brothers and sisters, what oftentimes happens is we all have heard about this spiritual armor. We all think, well, I know all about it and I have heard it and it's a done deal. That's what the enemy is telling us. Why? Because the biggest barrier to any form of learning, dear brothers and sisters, is not the complexity of the topic, but the assumption that I already know it. Because the complexity of the topic, the Spirit of God is there to simplify it for each one of us. But the biggest barrier to every single learning is... Always that I already know it. So dear brothers and sisters, today if you're here, we do encourage you. Please do hear us out. Please do hear us out all the way to the end. Maybe the Lord has something or not. Maybe I am pretty sure. We are pretty sure that the Lord has his appointed people. He has a supernatural message going on for each one of us. But two things here. Acts 17, 11, 
Number one and first Corinthians 2 14. We keep talking about it, dear brothers and sisters. This is the time if the Lord encourages encourages you, please do take notes, dear brothers and sisters. Why we talk about taking notes is it's the simple parable of sower. Perhaps Anna will talk a little more about it today. It's the simple parable of sower. There were four kinds of soil. But the three did not have any fruit bearing capacity. Why? Because we hear things, we get excited. And it is either the seed is on the path. The bird comes, the bird is the seed in here. And eats it. Or it will be the worries of life. It will be on a rocky ground or it will be the thorns of life which will choke it. But if we have it written, if we dwell on it, if we meditate on it, if we study it, if we go through the process of dwelling day in and day out on that, the brothers and sisters, then only we will be, the world grows and then only the enemy doesn't want us to do because the enemy will be defeated. Out and out defeated because the victory has been won. Genesis 3.15 has been fulfilled on Calvary. The head of the serpent has been crushed. Me and you, if we are in Messiah, we are more than conquerors today. So let's today invite the presence of God. Let's today the Holy Spirit guide us and let's today be an active barrier. Receive this same message which we have heard about the piece of armor, but a panoramic view which the Holy Spirit is leading Anna to today. So let us receive it with an open mind. Let us go back to the scriptures the Lord leads us to talk about today for us. And let, let's dwell on it and let's discuss about it, dear brothers and sisters. That's what we are here. We are in the end of the end of the end moments. So let's start with a word of prayer, shall we, Anna? Yes. All right. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you have brought... Your bride, your, the believers at this point of time where our faith is about to be signed. You have brought us in this exciting time, Lord, that the Bible talks more about than when Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ himself, walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains in Judea. We just thank you, Lord, the, to understand today the privilege that you have given us to be called as your bride. To be called as your bond servants. To give his stagger, Lord, as we begin to embrace the incredible, incredible, incredible extremes that you have gone, that we might live. As a father, as a father, to see your son go through the butchery. You gave your son to butchery. He was slaughtered for us. We just thank you today, Father. We thank you, Lord, that by your grace and your grace alone, you have called us and not by any merit of our own. We thank you, Father, that you have allowed your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, to go through incredible extremes, to be slaughtered, to purchase our liberty from the law, to be given up to butchery, to purchase our redemption, our access to you. Father, help us today. Not to take our salvation for granted. Though it is a free gift. But you had to give every single thing you had Lord. Today help us to realize the extremes you went. We thank you Father also. For the Holy Spirit. Ruach HaKodesh. That he's so diligent to open the scriptures to the diligent. I pray Father today that once again. You would please increase in each one of us. We bring our dear fellow brethren. Our dear brothers and sisters. Each one of us. That you please, Father, today increase in each one of us a new appetite, a renewed hunger, Lord, for your word and for you. That we may each grow in the grace and knowledge of our Messiah. And also, Father, so that we each might be more discerning, more perceptive to what you precisely have for each one of us in the days that remain, which is extremely, extremely, extremely short. Today we thrill, Father, once again. As we discover in your word the exciting demonstrations of your precision and your love which you have showered on each one of us. Help us today to take the supernatural message. Your word, 66 books penned by 40 different authors. But as a matter of fact, which is just penned by you. One author, the creator of you, heaven and earth, you, yourself. Help us today to have an unending hunger, Lord, for you and your word. And yet, Father. As we behold our horizon and we sense the urgency of the perilous times we are living in. 
We do seek discernment, Father, that we might know what it is you who would have each one of us do. Father, today we do understand that the opportunity is not mandated, that you have called each one of us to a specific task. Oh, Father, I pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, please make that evidently clear to each one of us, to our fellow brethren, to our dear brothers and sisters, that in the days that remain, so that we might each be more fruitful and more faithful stewards of the opportunities you're presenting each one of us with. And today, Father, once again, I bring Anna in your presence. I bring myself. I bring myself in your presence and pray, Lord, as Anna is about to convey your message to your appointed people, Lord. Please be her strength. Please be my strength in our weakness. We came on Psalms chapter 141, verse 3. And pray, Father, that please do set a guard over our mouths. And please do keep watch over the door of our lips as we convey your message, as Anna conveys your message to your appointed people. In the name of our King Yeshua HaMashiach, using our authority of Luke 10, 19, right this moment, we bind every evil of the enemy which is coming at this time, which is coming at this video, and at our fellow brethren, and at our dear brothers and sisters. And we pray. For the hedge of protection for each one of us. And Father, once again, I pray that may this message reach to your appointed people to accomplish your mighty will. And please do enlighten all of our hearts and minds, the hearts and minds of our dear fellow brethren through your Holy Spirit to receive this message from our coming King, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in whose holy, mighty name we do pray. Amen. Amen. And amen and amen. You can go ahead, please, Anna. So in Ephesians chapter 6, we learn about six different things which are our armor and one more thing which is the main piece of the armor. Let's take a quick look at the seven pieces of our armor. Number one, the first piece is the girdle of truth. The second piece is the breastplate of righteousness. The third piece is the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. The fourth piece is the shield of faith. The fifth piece is the helmet of salvation. The sixth piece is the sword of the spirit, and the seventh piece is prayer. Prayer is the seventh part of the armor, and it holds all the armor together. Let's take a look at how it holds all the armor together, in a way the Bible tells us. The first piece of the armor is the girdle of truth. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 43, this chapter is a prayer. Verse 3 says, Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Here, the psalmist prays for truth. The second piece is the breastplate of righteousness. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 says, Sow for yourselves, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. In this verse, God tells us to pray and seek righteousness. And the third piece of the armor is the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. Paul, in his second epistle to the Thessalonians, he asks the Thessalonians to pray for him and his companions so they could boldly preach the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified. The fourth piece of the armor is the shield of faith. And Jesus says in Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 verses 20 through 21, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And the fifth piece of the armor is the helmet of salvation. What is the helmet of the salvation? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. So our helmet is the hope of salvation. And the sixth piece of the armor is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Psalm chapter 119 is all about the Word of God. Verse 43 says, And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. In this verse, the psalmist asks for the word of God to always be in his mouth. For In this verse, the psalmist prays for the word of God. 
Do you see how prayer is holding all the armor together? Prayer holds armor, all our armor together. And it is the heavily, heavy artillery weapon of our armor. But how do we know that our armor is in place? In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told a parable about his sower who went out to sow in a field. And while he did, the seeds fell on four different soils. Let's see what pieces of armor three soils were missing and why they could not produce fruit. The first soil in the parable was the path. On this path, the soil was packed and hard. The seed is the word of God. The soils represent our hearts. Receiving the word of God means to believe the word of God. The path did not take in or receive the seed because it was hard and packed. So we see that believing is missing the shield of faith. And once the shield of faith falls apart, all the armor falls apart and the birds come and take it away. But there's another piece missing. And Jesus said in the meaning of the parable that the people who are the soil of the path don't understand the word and Satan comes and takes it away. Their understanding is lacking. Their helmet is lost. Their mind cannot understand. As 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 tells us, Satan has blinded their minds. In John chapter 1 verses 12 through 13 it says but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name who are born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of men but of God in verse 13 there are four things mentioned with go which go with the four soils three things talk about what God's children are not born of the three things are Number one, blood. Number two, the will of the flesh. Number three, the will of man. But the fourth thing is God. Whoever receives Jesus is born again and born of God. So the people of the path, we know that these are not born of God. So what are they born of? They are born of blood, the first thing. Why? Throughout the Gospels, we see that the group of people called the Sanhedrin, which included the Pharisees, Sadducees, the chief priests, and so on, they reject Jesus as the Messiah. Why? They stuck to the law. If Jesus healed on the Sabbath, they became angry. They thought he was breaking the Sabbath. They misunderstood the word of God because their hearts were packed in hard. But before moving on further, let's stop and think. What is blood in John chapter 1 verse 13? Blood refers to the blood of circumcision, or it can also refer to the blood sacrifices of the Jews. So these people on the path are like the religious leaders of Jesus' time. They are hard-hearted and they want to follow a set of rules. That's why they cannot receive God's word. Jesus came to fulfill the law by showing us how to live the way God wants us to. The people of the path can under, cannot understand that. They want to stick to the laws perfectly. It's right to stick to the laws, but we should keep Jesus at the center because Jesus shows us the correct way to follow the laws because he fulfilled the laws in the way God wants us to. So he set the example for us. And the second soil of the parable of the sower was the rocks. For this soil, the seeds could not endure for long because they didn't get any root. So what pieces of armor are these people missing? Like the people of the path, these people are missing the shield of faith. Their faith is shaky, so when persecution comes, they fall away. So what are they born of? Do you remember the three things? The three things are blood, the will of the flesh, and the will of men. So the people of the rocks were of the will of men. Why? Persecution comes when man sees that believers do not go according to man's will. The people of the rocks fall away when perse persecutions come because they don't take any root. There are things in their life which don't let them put all their attention on the word. That's why their faith was shaky. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So they heard the word of God, but the word didn't have any root. They had a shaky faith. So the will of men overtook them easily. They fell away. The third ground was the thorny ground. On this ground, the thorns represent the deceitfulness and shining things of this world. The people of the path were bo were born of the will of the flesh. The people of...
the thorns were born of the wood of the flesh, excuse me. The world enticed them and does entice them to be greedy for money, wealth, power, and so on. Those things choke the word and their and their will, the will of the flesh, entices them. So what pieces of armor are these people missing? They were missing their helmet, the helmet of salvation. And that's why the enemy put thoughts in them about these worldly things. Once that happened, their whole armor fell apart. So what pieces... What piece of armor are these three soils ultimately missing? They're missing the sword, the word of God. But there's one more soil which wasn't missing any armor. And this soil was born of God. It's the soil which we want to be, the good soil. That soil produced fruit. Jesus wants us to fight this battle and produce fruit for his kingdom. But we can only do that when we are in him. If we have our armor, we will bear fruit for Jesus and his kingdom. The spiritual armor is so crucial for us to accomplish the plan he has for us, but it can only happen through his strength. That's why God gave us this armor. We can't fight this battle with our own strength. The Bible tells us in Psalm chapter 20 verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That's the key. So in Psalm chapter 20, 20 verse 7, Two kinds of people are mentioned who do two different things. Number one, the first kind of person is those who trust in themselves. These people don't use God def God's defense to protect themselves. They make up their own weapons for defense, which don't even protect. They are foolish and think the war is against flesh and blood. Their defenses are hypocrisy, lies, deceit, and so on. Number two, the second kind of person mentioned is those who trust in God. These people use God's defense to protect themselves. They make the wise choice in using God's armor for protection. Jesus told us in John chapter 15 verse 5 that he is the vine and we are the branches. So we have to abide in him to bear fruit. We cannot bear fruit if we do not abide in Jesus. So Let's take a look at the temptations people in the Bible underwent and in daily life how we can resist those temptations through the spiritual armor. Number one, the first piece is the girdle of truth. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, we see that David, while running from King Saul, went to the priests at Nob. There he was tempted to lie, and he did. How can we avoid that? By the girdle of truth. Another example is Eve in Genesis 3. Here Satan lied to her. Satan told her that it was okay to eat the fruit God said not to. Satan lies to us even today. Jesus is the truth and we avoid Satan's lies by him. For that also we need the girdle of truth. Because the enemy lies to us every single day. And to fight that we need the girdle of truth. In, and the second piece of the armor is the breastplate of righteousness. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see that with Bathsheba, David was tempted to sin against God. He fell for it, but we can avoid sin with the breastplate of righteousness. And the third piece of the armor is the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. In Job chapter 1, Job lost all his pr pr property and children. In chapter 2, his wife told him to curse God and die. Job may have been tempted to fight against God, but he did not. He held his peace. And what is the gospel? That Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 through 4 says. So he is our redeemer. He redeemed us on the cross and he lives. He is risen. And in Job chapter 19, verse 25, what does Job say? He says, For I know that my Redeemer lives. That's what the gospel is. The Lord redeemed us on the cross, and he has risen, and he lives. And the fourth piece of the armor is the shield of faith. In John chapter 20, we see that Thomas, one of the twelve disciples, had a hard time believing that Jesus was truly alive. His heart and circumstances around told him to doubt, and he did. We can overcome all the doubts and circumstances life throws our way by the shield of faith. And the fifth piece of the armor is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is the hope of salvation. It is the feeling 
which the Holy Spirit puts in us to let us know that we are God's children, so we should not be following this world. Solomon, however, though he was chosen by God to be the, to be king, he went along with the world and he married foreign wives who led him away from God. We need to have our helmet on to avoid that. The sixth piece of the armor is the sword of the spirit. In Genesis chapter 3, Eve was tempted to eat the bad fruit and she misused the word of God. She said, Of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest he die. God had told them not to eat the fruit. Eve added to God's word and she fell. Our sword must be used the way God wants us to use it, or else we will end up in a bad place. We'll end up being deceived, just like Eve. And seventh piece of the armor is prayer, the heavy artillery weapon. In Matthew chapter 26, we see that Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he asks the disciples Peter, James, and John to watch and pray with him. However, James, John, and Peter all slept. Jesus came and again asked them to pray, and he went and prayed again, but the disciples slept again. And it happened one more time, and then the betrayer came. One of the disciples who slept was Peter. He did not pray, and just as Jesus had predicted, he denied Jesus when Peter said he wouldn't. We often fall into the same trap of the enemy. He makes us spiritually sleep when Jesus wants us to pray, and eventually we sin against the Lord. So we need our armor in place whenever we are tempted. God has given us all the weapons we need, and we should not be making up our own weapons. The armor of God was designed by God for every temptation. The Lord led me to write a prayer for us to put on the spiritual armor, and this is what it is. Lord Jesus Christ, today I come to you. Please strengthen me to put on your armor. Today I claim victory over the enemy by putting on the whole armor of God. I put on the girdle of truth. May I stand firm in your truth so I can be truthful no matter what it takes. Lord, help me to hold on to the truth so I can resist to the lies of the enemy. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. May the righteousness of Jesus Christ reflect in my life so that I can do what is righteous in your sight and not in my sight. I put on the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. May I be ready to preach the gospel whenever you tell me. May I always be peaceful so that my life reflects what you are. Let your peace shine through me and be my guide. I take the shield of faith. May I always trust you when you tell me something so that Satan's fiery darts have no grip on me. I put on the helmet of salvation. May my thoughts be focused on only you so that I can fix my eyes on unseen things. So I can fix my eyes on you and you alone because all these temporary things will perish. And I take the sword of the spirit. May I be ready to expose the fiery darts of the enemy when they come. Finally, I take the heavy artillery weapon of prayer. Help me to pray without ceasing so I can hold on to the end. And as your coming is so near, help me to have all the pieces of the armor put on at all times so I can fight faithfully as your soldier. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much, Anna, once again for the battle prayer as well as for giving us this panoramic view of the pieces of the armor, dear brothers and sisters. This, we really found it when the Holy Spirit revealed this to Anna regarding the parable of the sword with the pieces of the armor. Oftentimes, we don't connect it this way. At least I did not. That's the key, dear brothers and sisters, to understand that the times we are living in, as we are talking about, that we are all into all this. The enemy is pushing us all into the signs and wonders. That's just one aspect. And once again, dear brothers and sisters, we are not against signs and wonders. As a matter of fact, God uses signs and wonders in all of our lives. And if you had gotten a chance to... Here on the video which we were talking about our testimony of the miracles of Messiah which Messiah is doing in our lives. It's filled with so many signs and wonders and that's a good thing Bible tells us. I believe 1 Chronicles 
chapter 12 verse 32 like the sons of Issachar. We need to be aware of the times we are living in. They knew the times they are living in and what their nation had to do. But it doesn't stop there. There is a, this is a precursor. Why is God giving us a sign so that we can dwell in him? So that we can get in him. How do we get in him? How do we get to know him? By dwelling in his word. There are two things, dear brothers and sisters, going on. One is man's idea, my idea, our idea of God. And the other thing is God's idea of God. That is how Christianity is distinguished from every single other religion. Every single other whatever holy book or whatever they call it. And that's not to demean others. Because Jesus Christ says that he is the way, the truth and life. And he is the one true God. So that's what God says. And that's the ultimate word, dear brothers and sisters. So one thing is clear that that's the one true God. Now from there, where do we take it? If we are believing this one true God, if we are talking about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, then Satan comes and implants thoughts in our brains about how he is. Don't put God in a box, this and that and everything. That sounds good. But what does the word of God say about Messiah, who he is? Why did Messiah come? Matthew chapter 10 verses 35 to 40 is a glimpse. If you, would tie, if you would take up some time to read the cost of discipleship, what Messiah talks about is another example which we try to sidetrack with grace. So dear brothers and sisters, it's the word of God through which God has chosen to reveal himself. In 2 Corinthians, as Anna has put up the verse on the screen, as you see, we'll do. Probably let's read just two verses. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, and we are reading our New King James Version, dear brothers and sisters, that's Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4. Let's just do a real quick exegesis of this. For though we walk in the flesh, and this Second Corinthians Chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Dear brothers and sisters, our war is not against flesh and blood. And that Paul emphasizes once again in Ephesians chapter 6, the same thing. But yet, it sounds so trivial, it sounds so basic, but yet so many times, rather most of the times, we are so drawn towards Walking in our flesh. We talk about that our war is not against flesh and blood. When we suffer, we remember that. But when we are in our good times, then how many times we choose to call on the Spirit of God moment by moment to walk by the Spirit of God and not by our flesh because we are born in iniquity. Psalms 51.5 Our normal tendency is to walk in the flesh. If we walk in the flesh, Romans chapter verses 6 through 8 is our authority we are enemies of Messiah but oftentimes we forget that when we are not suffering when we are in our valleys then we remember this in our mountain tops we don't dear brothers and sisters most of the times why because that's not to point anybody that's the way enemy works that's the way enemy works but the question is how do we overcome that by reading, by studying, by dwelling, and by meditating on the word of God. That's where the parable of the sower, which Anna was trying to tell us today. That the fourth ground is the ground which was fruitful. And just by reading the word of God, we don't bear fruit. It doesn't grow. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. The sharper than two-edged sword has been used so many times in the book of Isaiah. So many times in the book of Revelation. It's an astonishing study once again, dear brothers and sisters. Two-edged sword. If you want to track it down through your Bible app or Bible gateway. Or however you want to do it through a strong concordance. Please, we encourage you today to track it down sharper than the two-edged sword. Continuing, Paul says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and powerful. Is the word of God living in your life? Living means it should talk to you every single day when you approach that word, the word of God. 
Is it powerful? Is it? Are you able to stand in the power of the word of God, defeating here in the power of Christ? I will stand, defeating the enemy. Is that active? Is it, is that enabled? Enabled today in your life? For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Of the heart. A lot going on, dear brothers and sisters. We encourage you to take this verse to a prayer closet and ask the Lord what all He is meaning here. There are so many contrasts here. There are so many functions, so many attributes of the word of God just given out here. And if we can really understand the source, so many of our problems will be sorted out. The word, as we see, it says, and is a disorder of thoughts and intents of the heart. In, intents of the heart. The word thoughts points to the objective aspect of the thought process. The word intents here points to the subjective aspect of the thinking process. Basically, what that means is the word of God can discern between the two. What a man is thinking and why he is thinking it. And dear brothers and sisters, if we know what thoughts are going on and why we are thinking, if the enemy is implanting or is it in the spirit, 90% of the battle is won then and there itself. That's the battle, the thoughts which are being implanted and we need to purify it. Through the word of God. Because the word of God is a discerner of thoughts and intents, not our intellect, not how we, what we behave. Dear brothers and sisters, why I'm telling it, it's not to, not a sarcasm or to mock or anything. Dear brothers and sisters, I had been a victim of it in our testimony, which we put up on the miracles of Messiah, which Lord has led to, led us to put up. We talk about that, dear brothers and sisters, in our, if you are aware of our background, my background, dear brothers and sisters, I was doing research in cancer for a certain period of time. And I thought that that's a good thing to do. We were, we were doing some good research and we were doing, we are trying to get a therapeutic solution to cancer, a cure for cancer through at the atomic level. And I thought that I'm going, I'm going to help the world with curing cancer with this. That's a lie from the enemy. God doesn't need my help. We are not here to make the world better. We are ecclesia. The Greek word means we are called out of the world. That's a heresy. That's how, dear brothers and sisters, our thoughts are. If you see this same situation of my situation, that I was doing research and I was doing to cure cancer and it was doing a good progress. It's a good, good intent. It's doing good thing to cure cancer from this world and we were doing pretty good in that. There's nothing wrong in it, but what happens? God doesn't need my help. I am here called for God's purpose. He has a different purpose. I can make my living out of something. But God has a different purpose. God is not telling us to make the world better. John chapter 17, we need to read that. The prayer Messiah, the exam, greatest example of intercession which Messiah himself showed us. Tells that we are not here to clean the world. We are not here to make the world a better place. The Bible never tells us that the world will get a better, become a better place. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, that's where we are in now. And from Revelation chapter 4, we see what happens. Revelation chapter 6, the seals open up. We see what is happening. The world is not going to become a better place. Second chapter, Second Peter chapter 3 tells us the world is going to pass away. Matthew chapter 24 tells us that heaven and earth both will pass away. So dear brothers and sisters, what might seem good to our brains, it may not be because only through the word of God is what can discern the thoughts and intents of our heart. Continuing to verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Warfare, that's the word we all talk about. We are indeed, indeed in Engage in a serious warfare, which as I was telling in the beginning, that none of us have a grasp of it. Why? Because we cannot see beyond this three or four dimensions where we, we cannot see beyond the atoms and molecules. As a matter of fact, when we see Messiah's resurrected body, when he is coming through the walls and getting passed through the walls and coming and he was in flesh and blood. He had all the he had the DNA, he had the RNA and the protein, he had all the atoms and molecules. 
but he enjoyed another dimension or several other dimensions. Let's remember what he was entering into is about. It had six offices, four walls, the floor and the, and the roof. And he was able to get in and out. And if we get to particle physics, we will probably find out that it will be about 11 or 12 dimensions. Jesus was enjoying there and we are not going to get there. But the part of the problem is we are not able to look beyond the atoms and molecules. That's why we don't see the spiritual warfare, what the extent is. We talk about it loosely, but we don't understand. We don't understand because our brains are not trained. Our brains in this world, every single technology, every single tech, every single technology, every single scientific details, every single scientific things, what it does. It teaches us the walls, the very walls of resistance, which are reasonings opposed to the truth of God's word. The pride of intellectualism, exalting itself in arrogance. And I myself have been there. I have been guilty of that. His, our Messiah, his precious blood, which has given us life and life in abundance. Life and life in abundance. What a privilege, dear brothers and sisters. What a privilege. What a privilege to be born servants of Messiah. What a privilege to be set free from the slavery of this world. What a privilege. That's what this world teaches us. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things. But associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your opinion. Your brothers and sisters. Humility is what is missing in this world today. Humility is one of the strongest spiritual weapons we have as believers in Messiah. Pride plays right into the hands of Satan. And dear brothers and sisters, humility is not self-denigration or self-degradation or a lack of confidence. It is a realistic view of oneself from God's perspective. The Bible declares Psalms 103 that we are a speck of dust. God does not forget that. But we forget that we are a speck of dust. When it comes to humility. That's what humility is. To realize that we are a speck of dust. And the manifestation of the humility is always meekness. As we see Moses. Meekness is a resourceful inner strength that enables each one of us to respond with gentleness and steadfastness. In the midst of opposition, criticism, or rejection, it enables oneself to see as God sees. Brothers and sisters, Paul did not depend upon his personality or human abilities or his authority as an apostle. Paul was an excellent scholar. If it would have been to the day we have to equate him, extrapolate him to this day, he was an ex exuberant. He was a combination of Intellect of Greek and Hebrew. He perhaps would be today's best of the Nobel laureates, scientific Nobel laureates of this day. But he did not. He did not depend on personality or human abilities. Or even his authority as an apostle. The brothers and sisters, spiritual warfare is usually won on our knees every time. Every single battle has to be won on our knees. Oftentimes, when we read about spiritual armor, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, prayer is our seventh piece. It's left out oftentimes in a lot of commentaries, in a lot of places you will see, dear brothers and sisters. But prayer, prayer is the one, as Anna was telling today, that prayer is the one piece which holds all the pieces of the weapons together. Our prayer is a heavy artillery which works at a distance. When we see the disciples came and asked Jesus to what? Disciples came and asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. Jesus was raising people from dead. Jesus was doing healing people. Jesus was doing miracles after miracles. Jesus was a good orator. Jesus was a good teacher. And so many different attributes and qualities. The disciples who stayed with him about three to three and a half years saw everything. But he, they came and specifically asked about prayer. Why is that? Let's try to understand in our jargon, in our dimension. 
when you come and when you go and ask somebody about something teach me this then that person must be a master in that he will, has to be a pro he has to be an expert in that that's why you go and ask right so we see our master is an expert in prayer we see so many so many of the times so many of the times we see jesus christ of nazareth himself was vocal his vocal prayer habit the vocal prayer habit of messiah and we have just seven examples here we see during his baptism one which is noted at Luke chapter 3 verse 21 and once again please do track down these verses dear brothers and sisters these are the gems in the end of the end moments which will help us to hold on and stand strong here in the power of Christ there is no weapon no nothing no enemy which can do anything to us so number one his vocal prayer habit of Messiah number one we see during his baptism Luke chapter 3 verse 21 Number two, we see during the commencement of Messiah's public ministry, as noted in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. With number three, we see on the eve of selecting his disciples, we see in Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Number four, we see all night long at transfiguration. Luke chapter 9, verse 29. We see at Gethsemane, we all know about the prayer at Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 46. And the Holy of Holies, who can forget John 17, dear brothers and sisters, today is the day if you have not spent. The Holy of Holies of the New Testament is John 17. The Holy of Holies of the Old Testament is Isaiah 53. These are the fulcrum of the entire universe. This is the fulcrum of the entire universe. The entire universe will be judged based on Isaiah 53. Can you imagine, dear brothers and sisters? So yes, we encourage you, dear brothers and sisters, to visit the Holy of Holies, as some scholar tells us, of the New Testament, John, Ch John chapter 17. A very intimate prayer between a father and a son. And number seven, as Messiah ceased to breathe, Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Dear brothers and sisters, perhaps the most important work we do is prayer. And oftentimes, we seem to have no word for prayer. Then that's all right. The Spirit of God, Holy Spirit will intercede for us. Messiah himself is interceding for us. John chapter 17 gives us an idea about how to pray, what to pray. And oftentimes as scholars say about that, the rule of them, I mean, that's not a rule or anything. People find it to remember Acts, A-C-T-S, as a good uh, maybe a good starting point or so for a prayer. A C T S A X A is adoration, adoring Messiah for who He is. C is confession, confession of how filthy we are. T is thanksgiving, thanking Him for every single breath He has provided us. And S is supplication for whatever we need. Already our Heavenly Father knows it, but we just take it to Him. So dear brothers and sisters, prayer is indeed one of our strongest, strongest thing which we do. And it holds on the pieces of armor together. So today we thank you dear brothers and sisters. As we end this, we hope that this message from our Messiah, led by our Messiah himself, which conveyed through honor, we hope that it encourages each one of us to understand that the enemy will be shooting the fiery darts of doubt, denial, lies, every single deception, every single doubt. But no weapon, Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against the believers of Messiah shall ever prosper. So today let us put on the pieces of armor. Let us say the prayer which the Lord led in at his or tell us to share with us let us say the prayer let us every single day in faith let us put on the pieces let us dwell in the word of God let us meditate in the word of God and let us fight the good fight and let us keep up the faith and finish this race strong we thank you dear brothers and sisters once again and we once again encourage you dear brothers and sisters to please please do Take this message to the Lord and whatever the Lord lays on your heart, if you would, please do get back to us. We definitely do appreciate, dear brothers and sisters, all your inputs, all your comments. We 
those are how we sustain in our valleys dear brothers and sisters we are a spiritual family let's keep encouraging each other let's keep praying for each other let's keep edifying each other exhorting each other through the word of god so that when we meet on the other side of the chasm we can fall down hold hands fall down at messiah's feet and worship forever and ever to glorify the king of kings and the lord of lords yeshua hamashiach jesus christ of nazareth and let's end with a word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right. You can go ahead, please. Lord Jesus, and Skin, I thank you for this armor you've given us to fight the spiritual battle which we're in, Lord. Help us, Lord, to use the defense you've given us and not make up our own weapons, Lord. And as we go forth from here, please bless us, Lord, and bless our viewers, Lord, and fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and talk to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen and amen. Thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and once again, God bless each and every one of you.